Well, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. I am thrilled to be here. I'm thrilled to see everybody. I feel like I'm almost back with you all, uh, but I will be very shortly. Today, indeed, we are going to talk about icons, and by that I mean venerated images. So images that um, have a special place in certain uh, denominations, anyway, of Christian worship. Um, and there's going to be a historical component to that, but of course, you know, many of us have experience with images, and I thought I'd get started by just asking you all, how many people have in their possession or in their families a venerated image that means that is spiritually meaningful to you? So Luann has one. Anybody else? Bill does. Does anybody have? Yeah, a lot of people do. So yeah. what kinds of images do you have? Do you mind sharing what you have? Oh, we have a, we have a Madonna. You have a Madonna? Uh -huh. An old master's. That was my grandfather bought. So it's come down from three generations. We're the third to have it. Ruth, you I had one. Eisenbrand. I can. Uh, oh, I, have a, I think I, I have talked a, to you about that one. I need, I need to take a look at that one that you mentioned just now, the Eisenbrand. Oh. Uh, who, else had an, who else had an image? Oh, I showed her a picture. I, of that. I have a um, Mary Magdalene, which some of you might remember. I brought to Sanibel one time when I did a Wednesday evening worship <clears throat> on the beach. And it was an icon um, dedicated to Barbara. I can't even remember her last name. The first woman bishop in the Episcopal, what was her name? You From Boston. Mm -hmm. Oh gosh, I'm losing it. But anyway, the original oh, Grace, Grace Cathedral oh, in San Francisco. Beautiful. Who else has images? Oh, there they are. There's some coming. Are any of them uh, famous images with names attached to them? Like the Virgin of Guadalupe or that kind of thing? Oh. <laughs> You know, a lot of people, a lot of people have it in their families. And uh, if you are, uh, grew up in a Catholic tradition, you might even know people who, who really have like a little, a little uh, shrine set up in their house and light candles and do all of that. Oh, look, look at that. And Kimball, and Kimball, we're just going to talk about that image. So that's an excellent, an excellent choice. Anne has just put up the <laughs> oldest known icon. This is the oldest icon we have. Um, yeah. And when I asked this question in the class, I've learned some very interesting things about the way people use images. There are even people uh, who, in this day and age, will take an image of St. Joseph and bury it upside down in the garden as a way of oh. making sure they can sell their property and stuff like that. We did I, it. We, we did, did it. it. OK. <laughs> <laughs> you see, these things, these things uh, they, they easily cross over into semi-magical uh, practices. So um, very often these images that are venerated are a copy of another image. You know, very often like that icon that Ann Kimball was showing, she doesn't have the original icon, what she has is a copy of the original icon. Uh, that's a, sort of a, a thing about, about images. And another thing about them is that they have a lot of functions within human society and within religious practice. So for example, they receive offerings in the form of candles sometimes. You can get benefits. Some people feel comfort from them or feel that they can pray to the image and kind of reach through to the other world and to a spiritual being that way. Um, and in some uh, contexts, we have images that have the reputation of being miracle working. So it's not just that our, our prayers go up to the uh, person who's depicted in the image, but also benefits come flow back down. So these images for in a lot of times, at least, they function as a kind of doorway between the temporal world that we all inhabit, the material world, and a spiritual realm. Um, what I want to talk about today is about some of these aspects of the image, not just, you know, what they're used for, but also really what their formal qualities are, what makes a venerated image venerated. And to do that, I brought along some slides. So if you'll bear with me for a second, I'd like to share my screen. And 
pull up. Uh, can everybody see my slides? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right, so I'm going to start with a couple of examples. Uh, this is a Good Shepherd statuette. It was made in the late Roman period in the around the year 300, around the beginning of the fourth century. Uh, it is now in the Vatican Museum. And what it represents, of course, is the Good Shepherd. And then we have this image, the Christ Pentocrator icon from Mount Sinai. Uh, this is an encaustic icon. That means it's painted with wax and pigment mm -hmm. uh, on a wooden panel. It dates from the sixth century. It is one of the very few survivals that we have of an image, an icon that dates from before iconoclasm, from the period of iconoclasm. And that's because it was on Mount Sinai, which was protected from iconoclasm uh, alone amongst all the other Byzantine monasteries. Uh, it's also the most fabulously beautiful icon. So I'm going to spend a bit of time with it today. Um, icons now, and, and certainly for many centuries, icons in the Eastern Church have been displayed uh, on iconostases, which are the um, sort of barrier, altar barrier, that is between the altar, the most sacred space, and where the congregation is. Uh, and so, you know, this is where you might encounter an icon, but we don't really know how the icons in the sixth century were used. We don't know whether they were placed in this kind of context or not. What we do know, though, is that very early on, icons do get moved around. People carry them in processions and so on. So let me look at these two. Can you see this? Is this in your way? Can you see it like that? Yes. OK, good. So which one of these, uh, how, how are these different as images? What, what is the difference between them? I mean, I can see that there's a different subject, right? But that they're both supposed to be Christ. But one of them seems really um, very present, and the other one seems more narrative. But how does, how does that happen? Color? Color is one thing, certainly. Dimension. Size. Mm -hmm. A flat panel versus a three-dimension. Mm -hmm. Right. So you have, you have a difference between three-dimensional and two-dimensional things. And does that make, is that what makes this image on the left? Um, is, is that an icon? I mean, would you call that an icon? No. No. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a statue, right? It's definitely a statue, but it doesn't, it doesn't reach out to you the way the icon does. No. The eyes of the icon. Yeah, look at the gaze. The icon is staring right into your eyes. The other figure is looking away from us. I mean, you could walk around and kind of try to catch his eye, but it's not as immediate. So there's some images that seem to have power to compel our attention in a different kind of way, to compel our gaze and also inspire our desire to kind of focus on that image. Um, Oh, this is, I forgot about this little object problem here. Here's another example of the Good Shepherd. Uh, this figure is in the uh, mausoleum of Gala Placidia in Ravenna. And so it dates from the fifth century. It's just a little bit earlier than the icon. But it too, it's, it's not a picture. It's mosaic. And it's not a picture of Christ so much as the picture of the good she Christ as the good shepherd. So it has an extra layer of meaning to it. Um, but you notice that he's not looking at us. He's looking off to the side. I think I want to, yeah. When we look at the two together, whoops, sorry about that. This is where my inexperience with live lecturing comes in. When, <laughs> trying to get things out of the way, when we look at, um, this Christ, is he occupying the one on the right? Is he occupying time or is he occupying eternity? The one on the right. Eternity. Why? Now, what about the other one? It, it, it's set in a scene, context. There are activities going on. It seems more timely. Yeah, I, I think the operative word is activities. You know, he's twisted around. 
what happens next? He's not going to stay like that forever. He's going to untwist. He's, he's doing something transient. And that, that quality implies time. So even though this is, figure on the left is set in a kind of paradise landscape, um, it's more of a narrative in the sense that it's implying action. You're okay. It's, it's this leg that hurts. Now, the qualities that make an icon an icon, part of it you've already mentioned, the eyes, the huge staring eyes, the way he f is frontal, he's facing you directly, the way his eyes engage with you. Um, we, and also the, the fact that he's on the axis of the composition, he's in the center of the composition, looking directly at us, it's a bi more or less symmetrical composition. We see that same kind of formal quality in all kinds of iconic images from many different cultures. This seems to be a cross-cultural phenomenon that when you're trying to create a relationship with a divine being, you have certain formal uh, qualities that you try to use. So this is a much later statue. It's from the Romanesque period. But we see some of the same features, even though they're in a very different style. There's a kind of formality to the pose, frontality, direct gaze. Is there anything else that's similar between these two? No movement. It's really just still. Absolutely still. The, the blessing. The hand up. Right. Look at the look what look at the iconography. He's got his hand up. There's a conventional gesture that his hand is raised. He's preaching or teaching or blessing. One of those things. It's a speech gesture. Anything and the other hand is on a book in each case. Exactly, Jonathan. Go to the head of the class. The other hand is on a book. So what is that book? We see it all over the place. What is that book? Surely the Bible. Even though it didn't exist when Christ was alive. Could it be the Old Testament? Could it be the Old Testament? The scriptures? It could, be, it could be certainly scriptures, right? Yeah. But why does Jesus always hold a book in these contexts? Book of life. Often the answer is it's the book of life. But actually I think it's another book. Anyone think of one? Uh, I am the word. I am the word. That's what John says. Exactly. That's what that book is. What it is is a symbol of the incarnation. That God's word is written down in the book of the flesh. Remember that in the late antique and medieval times, the parchment that was used to write books was made out of um, skin. So it's literally flesh <laughs> that they're writing down this text of scripture. in. So I'm sure you all knew that. But, um, <laughs> but you know, a lot of, a lot of art historians don't know that. They, they don't have any sense of what that book means. But that's why the book is so important. Um, and that kind of will bring me gradually to the topic of the incarnation, which I will continue with in a little bit. Um, here was just to demonstrate that, the, the hand raised. And also, look at the face of that. Is that a child? No. <laughs> no. no, it's not really a child. Um, this kind of image is called a throne of wisdom image. And it really is a visualization of the idea that God creates on earth a throne for divine wisdom. Uh, and Christ there is, is really the wisdom of God made flesh. So, you know, it's appropriate that he be a little man, a little shrunken down, but adult man. Sorry. Can I ask a question, Anne-Marie? Please. Um, so it's not that the people of ancient times didn't know how to portray children. No, no, they did know how to portray children. They yeah. chose not to in this case. Right. Um, less than 100 years later, uh, artists in Western Europe were making very baby-like babies. But that was because of a change of goal, a change of objective rather than a change of skill. So. Hmm. So there we are. Anne-Marie? Um, yeah? Bill Larson had a question. Yes, Bill. Uh, the, as you look at the image on the right, it seems to me that the the uh, icon's left eye, the right eye as we're looking at it, 
seems to be positioned a bit differently and a bit larger than the other right. eye. Is there a significant That's what I know. Yeah, um, that is a characteristic that we often see. And there's a little bit wall-eyed too. His eye is wandering off to the side a little bit. Um, I don't know if there's an actual reason for it, but it, what does it do? How, do what does it, how does it affect us when we look at it? Well, it makes me feel as if maybe he's keeping an eye on something else besides me. Maybe it's, he's all seeing as well as all, all ruling <laughs> as a pantocrator. Yeah. For me, and it draws us to the eye. It, yeah, it's, it, draws your, it draws your eye in. It draws you in. And are people, are real people symmetrical? No. No. <laughs> I'm going to talk more about that in just a little bit. I have another pair of slides that's coming along. So I have to, I'll stay in my order, but I'll come back. I'll circle around back to that little bit about asymmetry. Okay. So I think we've kind of concluded that an image like this has some power. Right? Mm, yeah. Yeah. It has a, it has, it feels like it's powerful. <coughs> what is that power based on? Where does it come from? What's the source of that power over us? Hmm. Like how does something immaterial and flat command our attention that way and cause us to think in a certain ways and cause us to have certain feelings? Where does that power come from? Spirit. From the spirit? It points us somewhere else. I think yeah. it's from the artist who is excellent. The artist is an excellent artist. But what draws you to there, you, you're drawn to it, but what draws you first? Is it the fact that it's excellent art or is it something about that face that draws you in? Something like an inner light. It's something that's really. Um, it's a little scary. It's a little scary, but it's very direct. It's very, it creates a relationship with you, doesn't it? It kind of causes in you a response that is like you want to respond to a person. You really see it as a person. You can actually don't have a lot of trouble imagining a person there. I think it's because we're kind of hardwired to relate to faces. Yeah, we're drawn to other human beings. We are because we are social animals. And the strength of an icon, the power of an icon is fundamentally based on that, on social, on the fact that we are social beings and we have a hard time not making a relationship with someone who's looking us in the eye. Now I have you a funny story. To compare it with the Mona Lisa, uh, only he's not really as good looking, but as far as the, um, uh, the eyes and um, what draws you to this icon, is it, is it a male poorly? Um, not such good looking male. Oh, I don't know. Kind or of am I completely nuts? <laughs> I think he's pretty good looking, actually. <laughs> but um, what I wanted to say about that was, it's we tend to we tend to look at an image. We tend to create a relationship, or we tend to respond with wanting a relationship to images very often. And I'm sure everyone's experienced this. Has anyone ever found themselves talking to an image? No. That I can remember. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a funny story to tell you because on my, I'm, I'm sitting in my sister's dining room and right across from me is the sideboard. And on the sideboard is a chicken. And that chicken was a gift of um, Jeannie and Hank glass to me for my birthday. And my sister has developed a relationship with this chicken. <laughs> Since it came in the house, I'm not kidding. When she sits down to eat, and she sits usually on this side of the table, when she sits down to eat, if we're eating chicken, she apologizes to the chicken. <laughs> and if we're not eating chicken, she brings that to the chicken's attention. Yesterday, it was sausage. And she says to the chicken, see? And I thought about this, and I thought, actually, that's a kind of very human thing to do, to kind of personalize something outside yourself. And I think in this particular case, this chicken looks like he has a personality, right? And so that's kind, of a, that's kind of like a funny thing, but it's not only religion, <laughs> religious imagery that creates a relationship. All imagery 
has to create a relationship with you if you're going to interpret it, if you're going to understand it. So one of the primary <clears throat> things that, a, that, a, that an icon has to do is create relationships with people, either because they are challenging intellectually or because they are compelling visually or because uh, it's familiar in some way. It, it, it recalls emotions and thoughts from a previous life. Anne-Marie, is that kind of like pictures? I know people that have photos of people who are no longer alive and they talk to them as if yeah. they're still there. Yeah, I think, I think it's actually nobody will admit it, but I think a lot of people talk to images sometimes, <laughs> you know. Um, it's, it, it, because the image is never just an image, right? It's always got power in a way. Uh, some more than others, but certainly there's an inherent power to that. And that is true, actually, for almost, I, I can't think of a human culture where images don't have that kind of power. Um, sometimes they react to it. Certain, uh, certain, for example, certain religions or certain sects within religions, including Christian religions, um, hate imaging. They don't want images, but it's not that they're indifferent to them. It's that they really feel threatened by them. That acknowledges just as much the power of the image image as if you adopt it as part of your religious practice. So those are, you know, image making or image destroying, those are two sides of the same coin. So then we have the issue with the second commandment, like how do Christians, uh, how do they um, process the second commandment if they're busy practicing uh, cults that, or at practice, doing practices that involve images and, and how does that relate to the second commandment? Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the historical background for that. So we see now today there's tons of images in many Christian, Christian uh, contexts, but this was not something that originates in Christianity, obviously. <laughs> um, the earliest examples we know of, uh, of human figures being used in religious worship come from the early period of ancient Sumer. And we don't, there are earlier images, we just don't know how they were used for sure. Um, but the entire Mediterranean basin, the Near East and Egypt, these, except for Judaism, with the, with the one exception of Judaism, all those other religions were image-based cults, nearly all of them. Uh, and that was true for the Middle East, for ancient Mesopotamian religion. It was true for Egypt. And of course, it was true for a lot of other uh, cultures in the Mediterranean basin. So this is the um, earliest example we have of a cult image that we're pretty sure is a cult image. It's a face of the goddess Inanna, the goddess of love and war, that comes from ancient Sumer, was found in the city of Uruk in southern uh, Iraq, and it dates from just before the invention of writing. So she would have originally, this would have originally been set into a larger statue made of multiple different kinds of material. It would have had wood core and then inlay uh, with stone and overlaid with gold. Uh, you can see there the, um, the grooves in her are for putting in uh, her hair, which would be made out of gold, and also her eyebrows, which would probably <laughs> Be made, or actually her hair might also be made out of stone. Her eyebrows would certainly have been made out of stone, maybe something like lapis lazuli. Now, in ancient, in classical times, there were, everybody had domestic altars. So the, in Roman times, people had these little altars that they kept in the, in the domestic quarters of their houses. And those were for their private cults, their private um, devotions to the gods of the larder and the gods of the place, as well as any other gods they happen to have a particular fondness for. So this is an example of a little domestic shrine for the household gods from Pompeii. And it would have been filled with little statues like this. So the, the, the idea of having little statues that you can buy and put at home, that is, um, that's an, an old idea, and it has just been carried over then into Christianity. So if you imagine the early Christians, they're living in a society where these things are quite common. Now, Egypt is a slightly different case. Egypt had a different relationship with images, although it also used image cults. For Egypt, the image was a body. It was no different than the fleshy body. It was a material object that could be 
the house for a spirit. So Egyptian kings always had substitute bodies in the form of these statues, which if the case their mummy was lost, they would have their their cause spirit, their spirit would have a place to go and take up residence and not end up being unable to reunite with the body. Um, and that for Egypt, the, the bodies, um, any material object could be magically alive and real. So in the New Kingdom, the ancient Egyptians, they kept their statues of their gods in temples. And those statues were the object of a daily routine where they would be wake, 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 ah, woken up. <laughs> Couldn't think of the verb. They'd be woken up, they'd be washed, they'd be dressed, they'd be anointed with perfumes, they'd be fed, and then they would sing to them. And then they'd have different things th through the day that they would do with the statues. And at the end of the day, they would take off all the clothing and wash them again and put them to bed for the night. So they really treated them as if the god was physically present. And for them, it was physically present. And this, this is coming to uh, this. You're, you're, it's going to make sense why, why I went there historically, because in the late class, in the late Egyptian period, we see this type of image being attached to mummies. So instead of like just putting the portrait of the person into the coffin, which they used to do the sometimes put a portrait, uh, put a face on the coffin, um, they actually painted a panel to put, to attach to the mummy. And these panels were painted in encaustic wax on panel. And that is where our icon gets the technique and also a lot of the details of the style comes from these encaustic, um, this practice of doing encaustic panel painting from funerary reasons. So, uh, and remember, Sinai is in Egypt, so this was painted probably in Sinai. Um, look at the shape of the nose, how similar it is. And the fact that the nose is outlined with red on the shady side of it. Um, the mm -hmm. slight asymmetry of the eyes, the fact that one of the brows mm -hmm. is a little different than the other. Uh, there's a lot of similarities, actually. And this is a sort of middle of the range one, but particularly is striking is the enlarged eyes and the intense gaze. So you can sort of imagine that the mummy is looking out of its tomb through the eyes of this figure. It's not looking right at you like this one is. I know. It's a little, a little alarming, really. So how do Christians like reconcile this tradition with their own practice and their own theology? We unfortunately... Uh, you can't just let things happen. You have to think about these things. And so it was up to the theologians to figure out how to justify image use and how to figure out uh, a place for images because images were already being used. They were already part of the practice. So how do you, how do you then, after the fact, figure out the uh, foundation, a theological foundation that makes that acceptable and okay? Well, fortunately, there was a lot already in the Bible that uh, about images, beginning, of course, with God creating man in his own image. So the first argument is that God creates images from the very get-go of creation. Um, and then there was the understanding through St. Paul that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. So in Jesus, in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. So in other words, in the image, the fullness of the divinity can dwell. So that's part of the way towards a justification of the image. Clement of Alexandria, and I couldn't find the exact place in Clement of Alexandria, but I'm convinced that's where I saw this in, the ped in his uh, pedagogia or whatever it's called, pedagogue. Um, he says that God, God created Christ in Heart to be an image that we could see and follow because we are material and human that we really can't relate to something as abstract as an immaterial deity. And so therefore, we needed an image to model ourselves to, to look at as a model. Um, and then John of Damascus, John of Damascus is really the theologian who um, solidified an argument uh, to support use of images. And John of Damascus, if you can tell probably by his name, he was not living 
in a Christian country at the time. He was living in Damascus, which was Islamic, and therefore had a, more of a, a cautious um, attitude towards images, a more strict attitude towards images. So he's partly arguing against iconoclasm, but he's also partly arguing against Islam when he makes these arguments. He says, first of all, God creates man in his image. And he also says that when we use images, the honor that we give to the image, the, the worship or the veneration, is not to the material image, but it's to the object that is depicted. So to the person that is depicted. So you're not worshiping the panel or the encaustic. You're worshiping the person who's depicted there, the, the transcendent being. Um, and then he says, but that's what God intended because invisible things have to be presented to us as images. And he's thinking now about mental images, about symbols, about metaphors, about all the ways we think. He's really making a psychological observation that we really can't think unless we have images to think in. And that images is the way internally we process ideas. Um, so he says that mental imagery, um, we're really, we don't, we don't confuse the image with the reality, but we use the image to apprehend the reality. Um, he also makes the argument that God commands certain images to be made, as for example, when he, um, when he commands that the two cherubim be made um, to overshadow the mercy seat and the tabernacle. And then John says, of old, God the incorporeal and uncircumscribed was never depicted. Now, however, when God is seen clothed in flesh and conversing with man, I make an image of the God whom I see. I do not worship matter. I, I worship the God of matter, who became matter for my sake and deigned to inhabit matter, who worked out my salvation through matter. I honor all matter. Was not the cross matter? Was not the most holy book of the Gospels matter? Is not the body and blood of our Lord matter? Either do away with the veneration due to all these things or submit to the tradition of the church in the worship of images honoring God. So that his argument is basically that the justification for the use of images is essentially the incarnation, that God creates an image and we create images of the image. Now, John also um, tells a little story. Oh, with John's head on the plate. Yeah, this is, a, this is a, a story that's part of John of Damascus's treatise. Uh, he tells the story of Abgar. Abgar, uh, who is actually a king who I believe actually existed, Abgar V. But there was a legend associated with Abgar that was um, uh, circulating, and that is the one that John tells us. So he says that um, Abgar, who lived around the time of Christ, Abgar had heard of Christ and he sent a portrait painter to get, a pic to get an image of Christ, to get a portrait of Christ, create one. And when he got there, um, Christ would not let him, or he couldn't paint Christ because of the glory of Christ's visage. So instead, Jesus like, takes a, a towel and he presses it to his face. And then his face is impressed on the towel and he gives the towel to Abgar and Abgar takes it back to his home city of Edessa and it became a famous relic, the, the holy towel or the holy napkin of Edessa. So what you see here on the right is a, the oldest representation of this um, showing uh, Abgar with his holy towel. Now this becomes a very important uh, image, especially in the Eastern Church, but also in the West. And it gives rise to a, a whole progeny of um, uh, images and legends um, based on this holy towel. But the reason I bring it in is that it has a, a very interesting quality, which is that the, t the image, having been transferred once from Christ's face to the towel, can now be transferred to another 
thing as well. So that it retains the power to transfer itself from and make multiple copies. So the legend goes on to say that the towel is then wrapped around a tile. And then the image of Christ shows up on the tile. So you have the holy towel. And then you have the holy karamion or tile or brick, which also has the face uh, imprinted on it. Then from that, of course, it means you have an unlimited number of images that you can have because there's no obstacle. It doesn't have to be the original icon to have all the power of that icon. The power travels from the copy, uh, from the original to the copy. So we get a whole series of copies of the icon. And some of these copies, like this one here on the left from the 13th century, some of these copies have um, even indulgences attached to them. So you're supposed to pray a certain prayer and then you get a certain number of years off your time in purgatory uh, if you pray to that image. So there are a whole sequence of interesting developments from that. Now, when we think about the way devotional images are used in many churches, you go into a Catholic church in France, this is Chartres Cathedral, and you'll see some images in there. are just there. Yeah, I'm sure lots of you have been there, right? But then there's one in particular that is sitting off on the side near the choir. It's in the entry to the choir. It's got a whole altar. It's got um, all these candles in front of it. It's got special lighting. It's got a special shrine. Obviously, this is a very, very special image. Now, in reality, it is probably the least special image in all of Chart from an art historical point of view. Um, but from a spiritual point of view, it's very meaningful to a lot of people. So this is the way this figure, uh, until recently, she presented. She was usually dressed in elaborate garments, which they would change periodically. Um, and all you could see is her face and, her, and the head of the child. Uh, she looks very dark. In fact, I think everybody would agree she probably falls into that black virgin category, right? Um, now, there are other icons or images of the virgin at Chartres that are in many ways much more interesting and much more artistically valuable, like the stained glass window that's a survival from the 11th century cathedral. So it's a very old piece of stained glass and it's a very beautifully done one. But this one doesn't have any, any devotional focus. There's no crandles in front of it. I mean, people stand in front of it and admire it, but it doesn't have the same power that this other image has. That power came from the fact that historically, Chartres was an image cult shrine. It had a relic, a famous relic of the Virgin Mary. It had a piece of cloth that was supposedly her tunic, but it also had an image cult built around one of those Romanesque wooden throne of wisdom for, uh, virgins. She has been destroyed in the French Revolution, but she looked like this. She almost certainly looked very much like this. This is, this is her portrait on the exterior portal. Uh, but the original statue would have been made of wood and it would have been kept inside in the crypt. Now, when she was destroyed, Chartres was kind of short of a virgin. <laughs> they really needed to replace her. So they replaced her by, and this actually, this figure was even made earlier than that. This was made in the 17th century, but it was used then to replace the image cult that had been originally there. So this figure was a 17th century virgin that was a copy of a Gothic virgin. It's not particularly exciting as a work of art, but it has been venerated for a long time because you can see that what looked like black skin was actually just the bare wood that her, she's been touched so many times on the face and especially the child that the, the paint that was there originally has been completely worn off. Uh, the rest of it is painted. But, and the whole thing was originally painted. But the figure is and also darkened by soot and candles and so on. This is what she looked like when she was taken down recently to restore her. And here's what she looks like now. Um, <clears throat> they, they have cleaned off all the grunge that was on the cloth, on the, on the clothing, and then they repainted the face. And of course, a lot of people were super upset at that. <laughs> But if you hadn't done that, 
what would she look like if you cleaned her clothing and left the face bare? That wouldn't look so great either. So that was the decision that was made. And there, this is the same figure seen before and after restoration. Wow. Now, why do they have these things? Why do they, why do they need these figures? Well, the great advantage of a statue cult or a, 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 an icon cult is that an icon cult can happen anywhere. If you're dependent on a relic of a famous saint, there's a limited number of body parts that any one saint can have. Um, and so, and there's a limited number of saints, although there's a lot of them. Um, but a statue cult can be established anywhere. So uh, venerated images are one way that communities have of leveraging power and creating interest and drawing people in. And that certainly was true at Sharp. So next time I'm going to talk about, not about icons, but I'm going to talk about narrative images, storytelling imagery that engages with the big picture of the incarnation. And that brings me to the end of my formal remarks. But um, so this is for next week. But if anyone has any questions, I would be delighted to answer them. I'd like to know if we, I, I had to take two phone calls. Will I be able to see the recording? Yes, it will be posted on the website of the, of the, um, of the uh, St. Michael's. Great. There I am. <laughs> there you are. Anybody else? Your children trumped you. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. I've got a question. I've got my hand up. Yep. So I'm sorry. I can't see. That's okay. There's too many of us. Thanks for this wonderful presentation. This was really fun too. I have a question for you based on something that I assumed was accurate based on hearing it in different places around the world. And in particular, in traveling through South America, I've been to small churches on islands, for example, where icons were uh, very present. But uh, the story behind that was that the icons were there before the missionaries were so as part of the strategy for accepting Christianity in some of these places, the icons, which explains the pro pro proliferation of saints in, in certain Catholic areas, the, the saints, uh, the icons became the goddesses and other um, pagan images that were there before. Do you agree with that? And what, is the, what does the evidence really show about that story? Um, I don't know about the specific story that you're mentioning, but there are a lot of cases where it's pretty clear that images are used to, uh, by missionaries uh, to uh, kind of materialize the religious, um, so the, the heroes of a religion to kind of make it interesting to a population. But what very, what very often happens is the population doesn't let go of their older tradition. So we see that in Africa and places like that where you have um, kind of syncretic cults. There's even uh, a also in, in other countries too, you get that um, where a Christian image will become kind of acclimatized <laughs> into uh, the local culture. So, but a lot of times those cultures already have image cults or images are already being used for religious purposes in those cultures. So people are kind of pre- preconditioned to, to recognize images as being powerful. Okay, I got the question. Yeah. I have a question. Does an image have to be a person? Can an image be something else? An image can be anything, but to be a venerated image in the Christian context, it's usually either a person or it's a scene, an, an episode. In Byzantine, um, in Byzantine, um, icons, you often see things like the Transfiguration or the um, Anastasius, you know, the descent into hell. Um, things like that will become icons. Emory? Yeah. Uh, not so much a question, but a, a comment. When you were telling us about the towel, the image of Christ's face on the towel, a, a, was it holy mandelion or something? Yeah, mandelion. Anyway, I, it, I, the Shroud of Turin came to mind. Yeah, in fact, I meant to say that. 
that's one of the results of that original story yeah. is that there have been a bunch of other relics that purport to be images is not made by human hands, images that are made by direct contact. And the Shroud of Turin falls into that category, definitely. There's something very compelling about that for people's emotional attachments. Interestingly, um, that was not allowed to have duplications made as, as that tile you were mentioning um, with the piece from the face. That's interesting. Yeah, you don't see icons of the shroud, although you see pictures of it, but it it doesn't it's not like the Virgin of Guadalupe where you see that image being replicated and in, and then a focus of devotion as much. That's true. That's interesting. Phil, you had a question. Yeah. Um well, I just had a comment that the um I've been told that the Celtic cross which is in our church has that um circle behind the cross. And when, um, I guess, Patrick um, was uh, converting the, um, the heathens, um, they worshiped the sun god. And so they said, but he's part of, this is really Christ. And so he c combined the two symbols um, and converted, um, you know, that um, part of the world to Christianity. At least that's what I've been told. That's interesting. I never heard that, but that's very interesting. I I actually always wondered what that circle was behind the. In the it represents uh, whatever. Um, I, I need a professional Irishman to tell me. Um, the sun. But, um, I think it's the sun. The, the sun. God. That's that's what he was just saying. Yeah. Yeah. Sun, yeah I think it is. I think that's right. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of, um, you know, that that cult of the un the unconquered sun, Sol Invictus, that I think was mentioned in the last. I think you mentioned it, Bill. Um, there was a period when there's at least one early Christian, I think it's a mosaic in under the Vatican or under St. Peter's uh, in the sort of caverns under St. Peter's that shows Jesus as, as a sun god, like riding in the sun's chariot and stuff like that. So there was, and you know, there's the son of God, the son of man and the sun. They kind of, in English anyway, they kind of, there's a kind of overlap there. Um, Constantine, before he became converted to Christianity, he converted to the cult of the un un uh, unconquered son. So uh, there might be some slippage there, for sure. Plus, you know, there's a isn't I forget the num number of the psalm, but there's a psalm text that says that uh, that's that that relates to the incarnation, where um, you know God is has pitched his his tent and the sun comes far out from the tent like the like a runner ready to run the race he's talking about the the birth of christ as if he's the sun coming out and rising and then running his race across the day somebody knows what psalm text that is yeah i think walter had a question yeah walter had a question remember to unmute. Unmute. Walter, unmute yourself here Hold on. You muted me so I can't talk. There, okay, there you can. Now, now you're talking. Why has there been such a antagonism towards uh, icons and images in the Christian tradition? Not just the Reformation, but you you can see it through history. Um, I think that there's a lot of different answers to that depending on what you're talking about. In the case of the Byzantine iconoclasm, I think there were political reasons as I understand it, that, um, that the monasteries who controlled the images controlled a lot of what went on in, in uh, the Byzantine empire because the images, you know, the devotion to those images was so powerful that they could manipulate <clears throat> the population through those images. And the emperor of Byzantium, uh, who inaugurated the iconoclasm period, uh, one of his motivations I've heard say was to try and extract some of that power from the monasteries and break their power over people. So that might not have been the theological justification, but there may have been also a, um, a practical reason, a political reason. And certainly it's true in ancient Egypt when Akhenaten wanted to get um, establish 
uh, more control over his realm, he had to get rid of the images of the god uh, Amun-Re because it was the priests of Amun-Re who were controlling so much of the government by that point. And part of what he had to do is just break the images and move his whole uh, operation to somewhere where there was no temple <laughs> so he could get away from the priests. So, yeah, that's an interesting. I think the, I think the really interesting thing is why did, why did the ancient Jews decide to go move away from images, which they had had because originally Yahweh was an Im image cult. But by the time we get to the period where the Bible is talking about, they were rejecting images in a kind of very urgent way. Like they're almost protesting too much. There's so many stories about images and in the early books of the Bible that it kind of makes you wonder if they weren't having a little problem with people uh, worshiping images and they're trying to get away from that. So why did they, why did they end up um, focusing their devotion onto a material object in the Ark of the Covenant, but it's not an image? And you know, what, what did that accomplish? I, I wonder From a practical if, point of view, I'm, I'm not speaking now as a, as a theologian. But yes, Anne. I, I just think that there was such an emphasis on the, the, um, the feminine imagery for the goddess early on, that maybe that's something they were really trying to get away from. There was mm. a lot of feminine images, goddess images all over the place. Mm. That's and true. I'm sure the patriarchy didn't like any of that. So it'd be a good <laughs> way to just stop that imagery. I mean, the other thing is that the image... The, whatever the image is, is so identified with people, you know, that there's such a sense of identity with certain images. So certain ethnic groups will identify with a certain image. And mm -hmm. that was very true in the ancient Near East, that every city had its own God and every God was very identified with that city or nation. And then when, when you were conquered, someone would steal your God and take them away. And then, you know, and then you'd be bereft, <laughs> you know, you couldn't do anything until you conquered them and got your God back. And there was this whole business of moving images around. And there's that interesting story of like the wanderings of the Ark of the Covenant. Like, what is all that about? I think that's very interesting that David brings the Ark of the Covenant back to, to uh, Jerusalem, I guess it's Jerusalem. And he's bringing power back to Jerusalem. It's, it's his power base. So it's an interest, oh. there's an interesting kind of yeah, question. political thing there. Yeah. What is the cross? I'm going to talk about the steeple. Esker. The cross on the top of a steeple? Yes. What is that an image? Oh, good question. I think I would call that a symbol more than an image. I mean, it is, I guess, an image, but an image is usually an image of something. It's a likeness of something that exists. So at least that's the way it's usually defined. Walter, where are you? <laughs> we had this long conversation about it the other day, image and likeness. Um, I don't think, I have nothing more to add to that. That's terrific. It's a symbol. Um, and what, what, um, what I think it was John of Damascus says is that the image is, is like the original, but with a small difference. The image can never be identical to the original. Just like Jesus is like God, he's very, he has the fullness of God in him, except that he is uh, begotten. He is not the begetter. So that little difference makes him the image and God the original type mm. of that image. Mm. Yeah. Adair. Well, images in some ways are very dangerous. Uh, I mean, they pull us into a relationship and we can imbue them with reality or project what we want to on them and uh, not really have a real relationship with the meaning behind it. Um, That's right. And think about, but think about how images are dangerous in that if they if they cause you to lose sight of the reality. That's, and I think that's the concern people have that, that with, uh, in terms of iconoclasm, that's the, that's the reason why people are uncomfortable with images for fear that people will focus on the idol and not on the reality. Mm -hmm. 
Yep. It's, a, it's a broader subject, though, than religion. When you think about how images right now in our culture are so vexed, you know, uh, like images of Confederate uh, mm -hmm. generals or images of, you know, how people work out their power relationships and their status and their, and their political goals. A mm -hmm. lot of it is around images and the manipulation of images. So I think, you know, we have to, if we're studying it from an anthropological point of view, it's interesting to think broadly about it. Hmm. You could even say that about Facebook, right? People cultivate an image of themselves through what they choose to to post and how they choose to portray themselves. So that's, that's a good point, like Instagram and stuff like that. Hmm? Yeah, it's the end of Facebook. <laughs> there was never really, that wasn't really an option back in the day to, to curate your image, you know, unless you were a, a celebrity or something. They didn't have Facebook, right? <laughs> Well, images and, and, and online people make an image of themselves. I can't remember the name of it, but people create an a, a avatar of themselves and, and use it online to represent themselves. Mm -hmm. And there's actually nothing preventing you from taking some lovely person who doesn't look anything like you, but lo much better <laughs> using that person. Well, it wouldn't be hard to find that in my case. Exactly. Visit any dating site and you'll find that. <laughs> <laughs> Take a picture of somebody that's much better looking and post it. <laughs> Wouldn't be hard. Wait, but Billy, will we say we're three dimensional when we're live? <laughs> As opposed to two dimensional on Zoom. <laughs> I'm interested in the statues and the images of Asia and the Far East, like Buddha and Kuan Yin. Yeah, and that's an area that's outside my area of expertise, but I did notice uh, when I was there that a lot of those images have a similar presentation, you know, like if they're venerated images, often they're facing forward, they're symmetrical, they're very formal. Um, and a lot of the same kinds of practices, lighting candles, lighting incense, uh, you see that for sure. Anne-Marie, thank you so much for this evening. It was wonderful. Um, we Amazing. have gone a little bit past seven and I don't wanna, you know, have people stay on if they don't feel, you know, because if people have to have dinner and stuff, but we so loved your presentation and we can't wait until next week when you do your second part. Hmm. Well, thank you very much. It's been delightful to see everybody and um, thank you all for coming out. Thank, Thank you, you Anne-Marie. Anne this has been wonderful. Anne Thank you. Yay. Thank you, Susie, for organizing. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Susie, right. and Sue, and hosting. Too. Thank you, Sue, for helping record and back up. Thank you all. Hi, Debbie. Hi, all. What are you Thanks. doing?